Well, g'day, Max here again. Welcome back to the shop. So, this episode, we'll just start off. I've just got a little machining project I'll give you a quick look at uh, in the bridge port. And it's just machining, um, clearancing some ends of some window bars, aluminium window bars, for the big windows that we are currently constructing for the new workshop. So, we'll get these knocked off, and then I've got a heap of other footage, a bit of a catch up on where we're at with it. It's been a few weeks now and I have managed to get quite a bit done. So we'll get that out of the way and plus we had a bonus. I had a couple of, well, one and a half days without rain and I just managed to get my um, other lathe in, a 530 by 2 metre lathe, a 21 inch swing um, JFMT lathe uh, into the shop. So that's good now. So anyway, I'll get these aluminium bars knocked off out and then we'll head out to the new shop. Oh, we did have a couple of stickers come in in the mail. Um, Ed Coo, um, Tennessee, EC Workshop, and Another one from um, Texas. Uh, Joe Pazinski. So he was kind enough to send over his. Well, they both were kind enough to send over their um, new stickers. So we have to find a place to put them as the sticker board is full. And I'm using the toolbox cabinet down here as an overflow, but now that's full. So, we'll have to find a new home then or expand our sticker board. <laughs> anyway, let's head over to the mill and knock these parts off. So, we're just putting in these clearancing notches in here in the extrusion, and I'm doing them in tandem just to get the job done a bit quicker. So I'm just using a double-edged stop. We we'll just push our parts up till I hit the stop, and then I have the scrap piece of aluminium pushed down. Make sure everything's hard up against the stop. Give the vice a nip. I have a stop set on the table as well. So I just plunge down with the quill till I'm at full depth, which is all the way through, and then walk it out. It does get a bit noisy with the um, thin aluminium, so I'll probably turn the volume down on this one when I edit it. That's all we have to do. So when our window frames are assembled, it's just to provide clearance where it comes down onto the lower extrusion. And it's also another opportunity to put our machinist jacks to a good use, what they were designed to do. So, yeah, it makes life easy with these things. So here's one for the books. 
The other day, Bruce Witham had an ad on Facebook um, selling off um, quite a bit of his gear that he has access to what he requires. And he had this box sitting here, micrometer box. Uh, I didn't really take a second thought about it. Then it had another photo with the box open. And I'm trying to enlarge the photo. I see a little bit of engraving down there. So I went round to Bruce's house, which is just round the corner from me. And lo and behold, this is my dad's old um, micrometer set. And I remember this thing when it was brand new back in the 70s. And of course, I used it for, for a lot of years myself. And so I couldn't quite make out the engraving. So I went round to Bruce's place and had a look. And yeah, bugger me days. It's our old micrometer set. It's from um, your dad's old company that he used to have. He started off Pyro Engineering. So yeah, I had to... I got it back at a good, a bloody good price from Bruce. So, old family heirloom back where it belongs. Winter's here in all its glory, and it's absolutely pissing down. We've had a lot of rain the last few days, and they're giving rain for all next week. Everything's starting to green up pretty well though, so that's a good thing. So, it'll be mowing season again before I know it. So we're about two weeks off getting our windows in. I've got everything ordered and the flashing's turned up yesterday, so I've got to put the flashing up first next weekend and then the weekend after that, all going well. If it's not pissing with rain, we'll get these uh, windows up in place. Just shuffling around um, a couple of machines today, just trying to find a, a final position for this boring mill. Well, another rainy winter's morning here in Perth. I guess that it is winter time. So our mission today is, is to make a start on our big window up there. So I have all the materials here now. So We'll swing you down after I clean off my bench and we'll get cracking on it. So we got one of my main, this is my best lathe, shifted in yesterday. So it, that made the long journey from the storage shed. So later on in the video we will take a look at this. So we have the learner truck drivers use our street for a to learn how to drive their trucks and do battle with their Raid Ranger gearboxes. Okay, we're starting to put together our windows now. So this is the window frame assembly. So we'll show you what's going on and how this stuff um, assembles together. So basically, it's this white material here. It's a 16 millimetre thick. It's called Dan Pallon. It's like a composite. A picture of the end of it. it. Has a lot of tubes that run through the middle of it. And I was really at a loss when I was thinking about how I was going to tackle this job. My original thoughts were with um, Perspex. And, but then I couldn't find any suitable extrusions to mount it and it was just turning into a big nightmare. So I came across this stuff here and this is available in different thicknesses. There's 10 millimeter, 16 mil as I'm using here and I believe there's thicker um, panels as well. The other thing that twisted my arm with these panels, here's a, a pre-cut panel that I've got. Um, these were actually offcuts from the company I got it from and they were just a tad longer so it worked out really good and they give us a really great price on it. So they clip into these extrusions so this is a lower extru uh, extrusion so it has the uh, vent holes, the weep holes for any water moisture that may want to get in 
and the rest of it around the perimeter doesn't have the weep holes. So I'm just cutting a mitre, just a 45 degree frame. And where the panels join together, I have this raised up um, section here. And this strip will clip over them. So what I have to do, once I've got all these strips cut to length, I might take them home and put them in the bridge port and then I'll notch out corner so when it sits on it's, it comes right down flush with the bottom of the window. So they'll end up strips down the window like that. Now it doesn't matter at all about that top and bottom being open as the top is protected because I have the roof overhang at the top. I mean, worst comes to worst, I could machine up some Delrim plugs or find some sort of plugs just to keep the bees out, <laughs> if anything. So, yeah, they all um, clip together and form one big four metre long window. So I still have the end panel to go in, into this one here. And then our next mission is to get up onto the roof and screw them in position. Now, there is a, a, a back ceiling strip which goes in between the window and the flashing just to give the materials a bit of separation. We've got aluminium going onto zinc loom and then on top of galvanised steel. So uh, as far as fasteners goes, I'm just going to drill through and I have some stainless steel screws. I picked stainless steel because I thought, well, that's the best of all. I couldn't think of any other more suitable fastener. I mean, the conditions, it's not highly corrosive conditions or anything like that up there, so I think we'll be okay. So, so that's just my other pile of extrusions. I've been slowly mitering the ends, and the other ends have to be cut to length for their final length. So that's where we're at with the window. So when we're up on the roof, mounting them in their spots up there. We'll bring you up for a look and see how we do it. So that's the tape that goes in behind the window. It's just an adhesive backed um, tape. It's about three millimetres um, thick. And yeah, that's my remaining stack of panels. And plus I got a couple of two extra ones in case I bozo one. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. So while I've got my phone, I'm doing this on my phone today. So I'll give you a quick overview of this lathe. I've had this for a while now and it's been in storage in the little old shed out the back there. Now I brought this lathe from Melbourne, Australia, 3,000 kilometres away and had it shipped over here. And till this date, I still have not seen one in as good a condition for the size um, that this machine is. It does need a few little minor repairs but nothing major. So it's a 21 inch swing lathe or near enough to 530 millimeter swing by two meters between centers and it is a, a JFMT and it's a very well or well, appears to be a very well built uh, machine. It's a Chinese machine. I'm not big on Chinese machines. This is the only Chinese lathe that I have. And of course, Hock Fuck Wong, my little benchtop mill. Is the, you know, between that and this is the only two Chinese machines that I own. Now, as far as Chinese lathes go, yeah, you, your hobby range, your smaller range, are, well, I, I just call them rubbish because that's what I think they are. Once you start getting up into the larger Chinese machines, some of them are actually not that bad. So, um, it's a metric lathe. There's a reasonable range of spindle speeds for the machine, for the size of the machine. Um, 25 up to 1500, which is fine. It has an 80 millimeter through bore on the spindle. You cut metric and imperial threads.
got a lot of um, features on this that standard lathe does not have. One being this bar down the bottom. It's um, it's a kick out. It's an indexable kick out. So you can index around different positions. There is another lever up the front of the machine, but I have to repair that. So that will automatically kick out the carriage longitudinal feed. The only chuck it came with was this 16-inch uh, four-jaw chuck, which is um, good size for the machine. What else we got? Oh, it's got a little plunger type oiler. It came with a genuine multi-fix Swiss tool holder. So I think that takes, uh, yeah, Oop. inch and five eight. I'm not, a, I'm not really a, a fan of these tool posts. It's too, you know, it's, I just don't like the idea of, ha if I want to do small movements, having to lift the, you know, you either got to turn the whole thing or shift your holder into another notch. Mind you, I've never used one, but I'm not a fan of them. So whether that stays on here or goes onto the uh, larger lathe over there, 24 inch swing lathe, yet to be determined. I do actually prefer the Dixon style tool post. For a metric lathe, it's the graduations are in 0 0.02 of a millimeter. It's a direct reading dial, which is good. One thing I hate about metric lathes that have a diameter reading dial, you either get them with divisions in 0.04 or 0.05. And personally, I find it a real pain in the ass to calculate back. Um, all your feeds and all that, cross traverse is on here, longitudinal there. Longitudinal is a bit sticky, so I'm going to have to do a repair there. Plus, it has rapids traverse in all directions, so. Oops, if you click it up, hit the button on the end, so we'll go into rapids and screw cutting. This is something to do with the carriage stop, this one down here. And your screw cutting dial and, and that. Now, it's an asymmetrical way machine. What that means is it's not a V-way, well it's sort of a V, but you have one large sloping section and then a steep section behind. So the bed, the ways on this machine are a bit filthy at the moment, but they are in bloody good condition. During its time in storage just here, there's two little rust spots there where the water has got in, so I'll have to um, give them some careful cleaning. It has a taper turning attachment, steady rest, and it I do have the follower rest for it. That's just a support for the lead screws and feed shafts. And it has a two speed tail stock. So you've got one to one or quarter to one. Um, the weight of it's 28. Uh, 29.70. So it's just a, a a bees deck under three ton and there's this arrangement here as we have power going through the saddle for the rapid traverse electrical box at the back everything appears to be in good condition here And there's something a lot of lathes you very rarely see. That's a replaceable cartridge oil filter for the headstock oil, which I thought was a really nice feature to have. So it appears to be uh, quite a solid bed on it, center plinth in it, just to give it a bit of extra support. So we'll give this a really good clean down. I do a plan on removing the saddle i want to give it all a good clean underneath and i want to go into the apron 
and just check things out into there. Plus we'll be removing and stripping the tail stock. There is a minor issue with this lever and it needs a new lever making. So just, just small things, but in general the mainstream items on this machine appear to be in very good condition. Now I did buy this looking at pictures and from what I've seen, what I was looking at was the amount of paint, original paint, it's never been repainted this machine, that was still in this area here. And it all appeared to be quite acceptable. You know, of course there's wear, wear and tear, fair wear and tear all over it, but generally um, it's in pretty good condition. Just needs a, a bit of TLC. So this will be yeah, my <coughs> main lathe for the shop. So fingers crossed everything's going to run alright with it, I hope. <laughs> the other feature that it does have, which is great, is it has two removable chip pans that are on wheels underneath and all you do is just pull them out to shovel them out. So that's a really nice addition. I will have to investigate these mounting pads. I'm just wondering if there's any tapped holes behind them that have been bogged up. So that's something I'll have to investigate. And of course the coolant pump is in underneath there. So another feature that this lathe has is right here. That is your headstock oil tank. So sight glass up there. That's a drain plug. It has two drain plugs. So if you want you can just undo the plug, wheel your chip pan out the way, let all the oil run down here, down here and into a bucket and funnel underneath. So it's quite an easy, it's not too bad a system there. There is another option. So if we're looking down the back of the lathe, there's our oil tank, and there's another drain plug there, which if you modified a tin funnel you'd, you'd get that, no dramas. Um, feed box here has its own oil pump and drain plug underneath with nothing. You can just put a tin with the funnel straight underneath that. No problems. And it has a fibre intermediate gear on the drivetrain there. I'd actually like to pop the um, lid off this and have a look inside. We'll see how we go for time. That'll either be, it may, we may do that or we may wait till the next video. So as far as location where this thing's going to end up, it will be in this corner of the shop. That thing there won't be there. Um, it'll either run, it'll either be a bench, possibly up against the wall, and then it will be in front of the bench this way, or up against the timber wall up the back there running across. Yet to be determined once we get all the other machines from my little shop at home in here. So we've still got the bridge port and the other lathe and a few bits and pieces. So I think I mentioned in a previous video I wanted to build a big hydraulic press maybe something around a hundred ton mark or something like that. So this is a piece of 120 mil diameter uh, chrome bar to, uh, it's originally out of a stick cylinder out of a 345 caterpillar excavator and it has a crack in it. There's a crack running through there so it's but the uh, lower half, I'll get what I need out of it. So slowly gathering the, the, the parts I need for it. I've got a um, pump which I think will work. So And I've teed up, I'm pretty sure I've teed up a, a D10 bulldozer ripper cylinder for the barrel. So we'll see how we go. But that's a future project. But yeah, I'll, I'll start that once I get all of the parts together. So, what else have I been up to since the last update? I built this timber frame stud wall. Just brushing up on my dismal woodworking skills. So, we're just making some stud frame walls. There's one half. That's the other half. And, of course, this will get stood up right here. And there'll be a doorway in between. 
and then we have to start on the stud frame walls for the dunny which will go over there. Now this goes the whole width of the workshop and it separates one bay. So the stuff behind here, um, I'll have my own personal stuff behind here, storage and other stuff from the other shed, which is not part of the mainstream workshop. So the wall goes here all the way across and of course the most important room in the workshop, <laughs> the dunny. Yes, yeah, so I had a play with my woodworking skills and oh, well, we got there in the end. I got there in the end. We still have to um, line the walls with uh, gyp rock. Yeah, so that's um, about all we got for the time being. So once I've assembled these windows, um, we'll be up probably to our final shed update by then. And uh, she'll be finished. Once the windows are done, as far as I'm concerned, the shed's finished. Then it's just uh, electrical stuff to be done, get the power in and all that. Uh, probably in the interim before the power, I will, with winter coming on, I'll temporarily install uh, four fluoros just probably in this bay here because I will be working in here on this machine first to get this ready to run. So anyway, all the best. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.